The last time uh, we were together and we were in the book of Acts, we finished chapter 7 and we started maybe the first verse of chapter 8. And um, this is uh, the section of scripture in Acts where Stephen is finally actually martyred. And he was murdered and it was brutal and it was violent and it was demonic. But you may not really remember that, that well because the experience um, is brutal and terrible and violent and evil as it was, was kind of overshadowed by the grace of God and transcendence. Uh, it seemed to be uh, much more prevalent in that section um, to talk about what Stephen saw, um, the great compassion that he had in his heart uh, for his enemies, those who were about to kill him, and the great peace with, with which he passed from this life to the next life, uh, you may remember, and you may, if you weren't here, you may remember this from Scripture, and if you don't know it, Stephen had just spoken to the Sanhedrin. He had just brought a very severe but very correct word to them uh, for the purpose of provoking them, piercing their hearts, causing them to recognize the truth and to repent and to be saved. Uh, but it didn't work. They got mad at him instead, and in a demonic outburst, decided to kill him. Um, but what was more prevalent in that passage was that as this was happening, Stephen, who we already knew from earlier in the passage, had a face glowing like an angel because he was in such close proximity to God and to his heart and to his will, uh, already um, had this incredible moment, this vision, you might say, that was more than a vision, that was reality, where he, no one else, but he saw into heaven and he saw the Father with the Son, Jesus Christ, standing next to the Father. Uh, typically when we see that scene in Scripture, it's the Son sitting at the right hand of the Father, but the Son was standing next to the Father, um, and they were looking down from heaven to earth as if they were greatly pleased and the son was standing to greet him because he knew that he would soon be coming home. And so Stephen had this wonderful vision, and he had a wonderful heart where he didn't actually curse um, his enemies or curse out his enemies. Uh, he prayed for them. He loved them. He had a, an amazingly um, gracious exit that was identical to Jesus Christ um, where he prayed for his enemies. And prayed for forgiveness and prayed for grace. And he understood that he battled not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces of darkness. And so he prayed for them. And then the Bible says, despite the brutality of the moment, um, he passed very peacefully. As a matter of fact, the writer wrote that he just fell asleep. And peacefully left this earth and went to heaven, though his body was brutalized. And so the amazing vision and the amazing ascension seem to overshadow the brutality of the moment. But today, as we begin this section and continue in the scripture, I want to take you back to the brutality of the moment for just a moment to set up the context of what we're going to be in today. Um, immediately, upon finishing his speech to the Sanhedrin, uh, Stephen was met with incredible and, ir and irrational violence. The Sanhedrin was known to be a judicious place, a, a, a place of order, a place of procedure. And in this particular moment, it fell from that. And the Bible says as Stephen um, finished his defense before the Sanhedrin, his speech before the Sanhedrin, they were so enraged, so encrazed, so demonically incited that they covered their ears, they screamed, and they just rushed him to kill him. And, and I tell you that today because, um, as I said in that message then, uh, I think it's important that we peel back the scene of what was happening in the natural and look into the supernatural and see what was spiritually happening just behind the scenes inciting these people. Um, demonic forces, spiritual forces of darkness, principalities and things and evil and whatever you want to call it, were working behind the scenes to incite the, these people. This was a uh, moment... Of, of, de of demonic um, intervention like we hadn't seen. Uh, it was an important moment. It was a powerful moment. It was a moment where God was coming through this vision of Stephen. God was coming through the power and the eloquence and the anointing on Stephen. God was coming and demonstrating himself through 
um, the glowing face of Stephen, but at the same time to counter that, uh, demonic forces met that with violence. It was this collision. And it didn't just end with um, the martyrdom of Stephen, the stoning of Stephen. It continued And Scripture teaches us, as we will start out in verse 1 today, it led to a great persecution in the church. Some would call it the great persecution of the church in Jerusalem, um, which seemed to to have been meant for evil, but which God was using for good. We read this last time, but I'm going to read it again to launch us off this week. Uh, We'll begin where we ended last week in verse 1, where it says, On that day, on the day of Stephen's martyrdom, A great persecution, a great demonic outbreak came against the church, broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And it says that all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. And so you have this moment. The church has been existing in Jerusalem for quite some time. People have been pilgriming to Jerusalem Um, A lot of Hellenistic Jews had come into contact with the apostles and their teaching. Uh, They had a period where they were somewhat persecuted, but the persecution was relatively light. They enjoyed the favor of their community. They were prospering in that community. They were growing in that community. The Bible says that God was adding daily to their numbers those who were being saved. They had a level of comfort. Even those outside of the church, as we have already studied in the book of Acts, began to have a a sense of awe and respect for the church and kind of honored these people. And they were becoming, uh, right next to the Jewish church, even intertwined with the Jewish um, faith, um, their own institution and and becoming quite comfortable. Uh, But with the arrest of Stephen, his presentation to the Sanhedrin, And the demonic outbreak that ensued at the end, that did not end with him, but continued to the church, all of that exploded. It absolutely exploded. Now, this is a dynamic um, that was true then and is true now, though maybe to a much lesser degree. It seems that any time God moves in a way that is significant, there's, a, there's an opposite reaction where evil moves to. Uh, you might say in th- proportion to um, the outpouring or the outbreak of God, there is an outbreak of evil. Many times there's this collision. That's what we call spiritual warfare. Uh, it can happen in ways that are minute. Uh, you could be at home and you could uh, be reading your Bible and have a wonderful, sweet, and powerful time and the presence of God, where maybe just a phrase of Scripture um, leaps off the page and lands on your heart as a word from God, and and it comes with, you know, those goosebumps and a tear. And maybe it lightly corrects you or inspires you or just gives you love and comfort for God. You have this uh, inbreaking of the Spirit, and then ten minutes later, uh, something seems to try to steal that, Right? The most powerful sermons I've ever preached where I've spent the week in the presence of God and His Holy Spirit has come upon me and, and, and I can't wait to tell the church and I think, man, this is going to be the greatest week ever. Uh, many times, that's the week when I come in here and I present it and I feel the most resistance, maybe not from you, maybe from you, maybe through you, maybe around you, uh, that I ever feel. And when I was a younger Christian, I often thought, well, I thought I had the will of God, but I must have not had the will of God because it didn't lead to joy and, and happily ever after. But now I know, actually, those experiences, that countering encounter um, validates and doesn't disvalidate the power of what is happening. So God has broken in powerfully uh, through the Jewish people in Jerusalem. He has established a very powerful and legitimate church. And and it's like there's all this pent-up energy of good heading in one direction that is about to be countered by violence in the other direction. Jesus recognized this dynamic, and he even explained it to his people. And I dropped this verse in in Matthew uh, chapter 11. Uh, this is baked in a passage that has a whole different context, but this is like a, this is like a guiding principle, something we need to know. Uh, really not the most major theme in this message, but why not take a little time for it? He says, from the days of John the Baptist, Jesus was saying this to his disciples, as you need to know this, from the j- days of John the Baptist, which, which ushered in 
the era of the Messiah and of the church that continues to this day. So in this age, in this period of history, um, as God is breaking in, and this could be said true before, but especially right now, um, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence. And violent people have been raiding it. Uh, In an older version that I like better, um, it says the kingdom of God, um, it comes by force, but the force will lay hold of it. For every action, there's an opposite reaction. You've heard me say, for every spiritual action of good, there's an opposite reaction of evil. It's not an opposite and equal reaction, though it feels more than equal at the time. The real strength is in the first action, which is the action of God, who is, who is above all and stronger than all. But we must realize in time and space and place, there's this collision, there's this violence. And that's exactly what the early church is experiencing. Now, to them, at that moment, it had to feel like, as it does to us in our moments, that they were losing. Uh, It had to feel like, um, man, we thought we were on the right track. We thought we were going to take over Judaism. We thought we were going to take over the whole world. We thought we were going to live happily ever after. Um, Now we're realizing, uh uh-oh, this has made us the enemy of the world, And we seem to have no power to stand against it. Uh, So, you know, we've got to flee. Um, But the good news for them and the good news for us is what the enemy means for evil, God uses for good. And actually, um, the Lord is allowing this. Clearly, the Lord is allowing this. He didn't cause it. He's not the author of it. He's not the persecutor um, of his own people, but he allowed it for his purposes. Uh, Remember when um, Peter was to be tested. The evil was going to come and tempt him and it was going to test him. Jesus spoke to Peter and he said, you know what, the enemy has come before the Father and he has asked for permission to sift you. It wasn't my idea, Jesus was saying. It wasn't the Father's idea to test you, to take you through something difficult. But the enemy has come to us. He sees his weakness in you. And we have given him permission with limits to test you. I know that's hard to hear. If we look at the book of Job in the Old Testament, before any of those plagues fell upon Job, the Lord allowed it. That's really, really difficult to hear. Now, this persecution came on the early church. It came on these people. It occasionally comes on us, and though God did not cause it, he allowed it, and we know that because he's good, though it was meant for evil, he will ultimately use it for good. One of the questions that we're always tempted to ask ourselves is why would God allow good th- bad things to happen to good people? Why would God allow me to be persecuted? Why would God allow me to suffer? Why would God allow me to become uncomfortable? First thing is, uh, bad things happen to good people. That's a relative statement because none of us are that good. And the only thing I can tell you philosophically is, Scripture says that all things work for good for those who are called according to God's purposes. That what is meant for evil is used for good. Therefore, as James says, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. Because, you know, you can read on in the verse in that, God is using it for good. In this particular space, in this particular place, and even as we apply this to ourselves, uh, why would God allow this persecution to break out against the church? And the most obvious reason, though there may be many reasons, and there may be a mystery here that I can't even understand, the most obvious reason that I think that this was allowed to happen, and I'm theorizing a little bit, but not too much, was because God was ready to make his, world, his movement worldwide. Um, there was a significant moment in the history of Christianity, of the Christian movement, of the movement for Christ with John the Baptist. Uh, there, was a, there was a huge epic moment with the birth of Jesus Christ. A huge moment when Christ started his public ministry at the wedding in Cana of Galilee. A huge moment when, um, when Christ died on the cross. A huge moment in the faith 
when he rose from the dead and, you know, showed himself to many people. A huge moment in the faith when he ascended into heaven. A huge moment in the faith that's getting close to the time we're at now where at Pentecost his Holy Spirit fell down and anointed many people to begin to do his work. Uh, A huge moment when the apostles were anointed and the early church was anointed and they grew to the point where they are now. And now we're at another huge moment where where what God has so incubated and caused to be and, and nourish and nurtured now needs to go worldwide. And those people, as wonderful as they were, as well as they knew Jesus, as great as their leadership had to have been because they were led literally directly um, by the apostles, they were a lot like us. Uh, They were not prone to go, they were prone to stay. And so why would God allow this? Why would God allow uh, persecution? Why would, does God allow um, crisis? Well, one thing we know is that when we're under um, the gun, because of the spirit that exists in us, um, ultimately and eventually we will draw near to God. We will surrender to God, and we will be transformed by God. Uh, for those who don't have the spirit of God, who don't have um, that internal fortitude, Uh, that exists inside of these bodies, this might be devastating. But for those of us who have the glory of God, the Spirit of God existing inside, then we have the wisdom, and sometimes it takes a little while to get there, to ultimately reach up to God for understanding, for strength, for power to overcome, um, but for more than anything, for information to know how to respond. And so that is what is... That is what is happening here. Why would God allow this to happen? Well, one, first and foremost, his passion. He wanted to reach the nations. He didn't want to just reach Jerusalem. He didn't want to just exist in and around the temple where they currently existed. He didn't want to just uh, reach Jews. He didn't want people to just come and see how many they could fit into this city and become part of the church. He wanted to go to the ends of the earth. And we know that is true because that is exactly what he commissioned just before his uh, ascension. He, he, uh, the great commission is a great command. And he meant it when he said, I want you to go to all nations and make disciples, right? Right? And so the first reason is his passion. There's a second reason as well that's related to the first reason. And the second reason is sanctification. Sanctification is the process by which we become much more like Jesus than like ourselves. Where we begin to operate as if we're in the kingdom of God on earth even before heaven where we forsake selfish things, self-motivated things, comfortable things, for the things of God, to be a servant, to be used, to be made more like Jesus. This is, in, this is an incredibly important motive. The Lord did not want them to simply exist there, become politically powerful there, become popular there, become prosperous there, forever and ever exist there, um, recreate and resurrect the Davidic dynasty before the second coming of Jesus Christ. He wanted them to be a people on the go, uh, a people like he was, living this incredibly radical lifestyle. It's not a very popular thing to tell a group of people that God cares much, much, much more about their sanctification, about their purification, about the transformation of their character, about becoming less selfless than about becoming more comfortable. That is not a popular message, yet that is the message of the gospel. Now, that does not come without benefits. That does not come without wonderful uh, promises that we'll get into in a minute. But the gospel is, and the lifestyle Jesus laid out, speaks to um, a people that are being called out of comfort, into discomfort, and to a very radical lifestyle. About a week ago, um, I was reading in the book of Revelation, and there's a section in the book of Revelation, and if you were here when I preached that series, you remember this section. In the book of Revelation, there's a section, and and it's God or Christ speaking to the church, and what he's saying to the church is, he's saying, church, my people, my children, spiritual Israel, whatever we want to categorize ourselves as, believers, and, 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 and the Lord is speaking. He's saying, he's saying, I'm calling you out. He's saying, come out of Babylon. Come out of the world. 
come out of the world so that one, you do not share in her sins. Two, you do not share in her punishment. And three, related to the second, you do not share in her ultimate condemnation. Come out while you even still exist there. You may be in Babylon. You may not be able to escape Babylon this side of eternity. But even in the midst of Babylon, don't be Babylonian. Come out in heart. Come out in mind. Come out in attitude. Don't be at home in Babylon. Don't be comfortable in Babylon. Don't make yourself a whole bunch of friends, so to speak, though we're, you know, called to love everybody in Babylon for the purposes of self, uh, for mutual um, assurance. Come out of Babylon. Come out of the world and come into the kingdom even before you leave the world. Come out. And the world in Babylon is about wealth. It's about comfort. It's about self-serving relationships. It's about resources and possessions and time and place and space. Ultimately, though, maybe it might look on the surface like you're being benevolent towards others, ultimately sowing so that you can personally reap for yourself. That's Babylon. We live in Babylon if we live in America. We live in Babylon if we live in actual Babylon in Iraq. We live in Babylon if we can live in Africa and be in Babylon. Babylon has taken over the world. As far as space is concerned, Babylon and the attitudes and the philosophies of this world have taken over the world. And, and, and I'm reading this section, and Jesus is calling his bride out of Babylon, and I realized at that moment that that was my calling. Personally, for me, I'm an evangelist, and I teach people to fall in love with Jesus and give their life to him. That's, in a way, calling them out of Babylon. I'm also a pastor who preaches to, you know, the saved, those who are filled with the Holy Spirit. And I let them know that, hey, your spirit is willing to come out of Babylon, but your flesh, it loves it some Babylon. So, you know, pay attention to your spirit and diminish your flesh fast. Disciple yourself and get the heck out of Babylon and get into the kingdom. Because when the king comes, we're, he's going to know the difference. And those who have been filled and led by his spirit and have come out of Babylon, though we continue to exist there, I realize that's my job. Another thing I realize, and I just realized this standing backstage, and this is why it's so uncomfortable for me, um, I also realize that my job, can you believe this? And some of you might want to leave the church as soon as I say this, because you'll realize my agenda is right here before your face. My job is not to make you a Christian. A, A doctrinally pure, ascribing Christian. My job, as far as I'm concerned, is to radicalize you. It's to see you radicalized. To see you catch on fire for God. To see you not willing to accept that reluctantly i got to leave the world to go into the kingdom, but to see you fired up to do so. I want you to be radical. Jesus wanted you to be radical. You cannot read the Gospels of Jesus Christ and find anything about grace translating to comfort and self-interest. It does not exist. He called us to a radical lifestyle where we left everything and followed him, literally, in attitude, in emotion, in every way. He, he, the Gospels call us out of Babylon. The epistles uh, written by the apostles call us out of Babylon. And in Revelation, he just says it, get out of Babylon. So my job is to radicalize you. Now, I know that's a weird thing to say in a time of terrorism where radical is such a terrible word, but we are not to be radicalized the way other people are radicalized to kill. We're to be radicalized to love and to love at great cost and even great difficulty. So why would God allow this persecution to break out against his church? Why would Jesus, who loves his bride more than anything else, allow this persecution to break out against the church? Why would these precious people who are beginning to prosper, who are beginning to rest, who are beginning to have place, who are beginning to have space, who are beginning to have status in Jerusalem, why would this persecution break out? Because Jerusalem, just like everywhere we live, is Babylon. And he's calling them out. And and, and his intention is for them to live this dynamic and spirit-filled, crazy existence, this radical existence for the purposes of his passion and his kingdom. Why would he allow families to be separated? And indeed, they were. 
Why would he allow people with children, even babies, to have to flee their home at at great peril and discomfort? Why would he do that? Well, because his passion to reach the lost for their eternal home means more to him than our comfort in our temporal home. And because he cares more about your character, more about your sanctification, more about you beginning to look like him than he does about you looking like the world. And that is a hard message, isn't it? That's a hard thing to apply. And our mentality in the church is that that is for the apostles, that that is for the elite, that that is for the full-time Christian worker or missionary, that is for maybe Billy Graham, that is maybe for uh, Mother Teresa, that might be for Brian if he keeps on the path, that might be even for the elders in the church, but that's not for me. But the truth is it's from the least to the greatest. It's all of us. We're being called to radical lifestyle. That's why he would allow it. In verse 2, we're back on path here. That was, just, that was just free. That was just extra information. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. That was good. He didn't care. He was in heaven. But Saul began to destroy the church. Now remember Saul would become the apostle Paul, and they just keep mentioning him. They keep dropping him in uh, to, this, to this story as we go, because pretty soon um, Paul, uh, Saul becomes the apostle Paul, and he becomes the dominant character for the rest of the book of Acts, because he becomes the most influential, I would say, and powerful apostle, the 13th, you might say, who takes the gospel to the ends of the earth. Um, He becomes the dominant character. But at this point, he's still a bad guy. He's not a good guy. And so he was destroying the church. He was an instrument for this persecution. He was going from house to house. He dragged off both men and women, and he put them in prison. Uh, He was bad. But don't worry. uh, A radical reversal is about to come. And with the same powerful, uncompromising attitude that he seems to be seeking evil, uh, God, I, I know this sounds strange, I think the Lord saw some things there that were good. He just saw that he was utterly heading in the wrong direction. So on the Damascus Road, he was going to have a violent encounter himself. He's going to be flipped around, and he was going to take all that, I don't know, for lack of a better word, ambition in the r- direction that God wanted him to go. But in the meantime, among those who were persecuted, among those who fleed among those who were undoubtedly afraid and disorganized and confused and becoming incredibly marginalized. In the meantime, those people, look what they did. This is interesting. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Isn't that amazing? Uh, You think they would hide. You think they would do what Job's wife told him to do, which is renounce their faith and die. Why would you serve a God who just blew up your home, put your brother in prison, has put your children in peril, has taken away your comfort, killed your buddy Stephen, or allowed him to be killed, and now has scattered you all over the world? Why would you serve him? You should curse that God and you should die. What in the world could be the benefit of that? But guess what? The spirit that is in them is greater than the spirit that is in the world. And though their flesh was weak, uh, their spirit was absolutely willing. And what happens, as I told you just before, when you take someone who is filled with the spirit of God and you make things tougher, uh, the spirit seems to come out. Because they are naturally drawn to, they are blessed and endowed with the ability and discomfort to draw closely to God. And what happens when you draw closely to God? You don't draw to a God with a martyr mentality, though he may call you to be martyred. You draw to a radical God who is bold and powerful. And so these uh, people who should be afraid and most certainly were marginalized, they became radicalized. Jesus turned them into radicals. Now, remember, radical, it's a botanical term. It actually means to be close to the root, to be very pure and powerful and close to the root. So when I say radical, uh, I'm saying these people were radicalized because their circumstances caused them to be driven relationally into God and to be made very, very potent in that relationship, therefore very, very much like him, right? They were radicalized. They were emboldened, and they were greatly empowered. And, and by the way, not the 11, because remember the, the 12, the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. They stood their post. Uh, this was everybody else going. Uh, this was the general member of the congregation, going wherever they went. If they didn't go to jail, they preached the gospel. If they went to jail, they probably preached the gospel as well. Specifically, 
There was a man named Philip. Philip was one of the seven, along with Stephen, that was called to be a deacon in the early church. The apostles decided that they needed to be more spiritual and not uh, weigh in on the material matters, though those mattered in the early church. Uh, They decided they needed to devote themselves to prayer. They needed to devote themselves to studying the scriptures. They needed to devote themselves uh, to writing some scripture. They needed to devote themselves to writing and preaching sermons. They devoted themselves to prayer and to God's word and to administering or dismissing that word uh, to the church. So they called these other seven men uh, to come in and handle the more worldly affairs and handle the finances and, I don't know, operations and things like that. They were filled with the Spirit too, but that's kind of how they worked together. But then Philip lost that job and was placed, you know, away from Jerusalem in this great persecution. So what does he do? Does he wait for an apostle to show up to begin to preach the gospel so that he can count the money? No, he begins to preach the gospel just like everyone else. Not because it was ever mandated. There were no instruction manuals for the persecution. The spirit of God that lived inside of him began to work this way through him and out of him. It said this Philip went down to a city in Samaria. And he proclaimed the Messiah there. It says, when the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. Now, the Samaritans were, um, were racially impure, according to the Hebrew people. We wouldn't say they're racially impure. We would say uh, they were properly breaded. Um, down south, where I'm from, cousins marrying cousins. That's how the Hebrew people were. And that's not a good thing. It's good if you marry outside of that. It just makes life better. Anyway, that's kind of what was happening here. And because they weren't pure Hebrews, uh, they weren't seen, um, they they were a little despicable to the regular Hebrew people. Um, But they were Jewish for the most part, or Jewish at least intent. They worshiped the same God as the Jews. They wanted to be a Jew, but they were kind of kept at an arm's length by the Jews. They desired to help the Jews rebuild the second temple. Um, But the Jews rejected them because they just didn't feel like they were worthy. And so the Jews were hanging out around Jerusalem, and they were building the second temple. And the Samaritans hung out, you know, in Samaria, and and they built a temple that wasn't proper, according to Scripture, on a place called Mount Gerizim. So that when Jesus uh, met the Samaritan woman, she wanted to know, should we worship in the temple or on the mountain? He said, well, the temple's the right place, but the time's coming, it's not going to matter. Anyway, those were the people. Racially impure, but not really. Theologically impure, that was really the truth. But they worshiped the same God, and they had the same expectation of the coming of the Messiah that the Jewish people had. So playing off of that, Philip began to teach them who the real Messiah was through Jesus. And so God anointed him, and God blessed him. And not only was he giving, given incredible knowledge and wisdom and eloquence, he probably couldn't believe that he remembered everything the apostles ever taught him, and God kept adding more. He was also given great power in authority and he had the capacity to um, show the power and authority of God through acts of loving kindness he was just like the apostles and just like Jesus even though he didn't have the status it said here for for with shrieks impure spirits came out of many and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed so there was great joy in the city so he was an incredible witness um, when, Jesus, when Philip went to Samaria, it was the same as when Jesus went somewhere. Their encounter with Philip was, I don't know if it was absolutely identical, but it was almost identical to any encounter anybody ever had with Jesus. Think about that. And he wasn't even an apostle. Uh, but he was radicalized. He was close to the root. He was close to the source. And he was on the mission. It's interesting to me um, that the way this is described here, um, his ability to heal, um, the way it is described is, is first and foremost his ability or the power and the authority he had um, to deliver people of evil spirits. He had authority over evil spirits to say to them, go out, just like Jesus did, to bind them, to loose them, to do all the things Jesus seemed to do um, with these impure spirits. And, 
And he seemed to do it in such a way as as soon as it would happen, it would lead to people's healing. But it became very obvious to everybody around that he had authority over evil. Now, that's interesting to me because basically right here, Philip is shredding the same demonic forces that ran him and many others out of Jerusalem. Isn't that interesting? When these demonic forces rose up against them and persecuted them and put many in prison and, I don't know, martyred at least one guy and caused them all to flee and all to become disoriented and all to lose their homes, it was as if they had absolutely no power to stand against it. But as soon as they were dispersed and out on the mission with God, those same spirits had to cower in their presence. Isn't that interesting? Are you connecting the dots with me today? I wonder, for me, because I'm sure all of you have this perfect, I wonder for me, let's make it, let's do it this way. I do it that, too much. I'll do it this way. I wonder for me what strongholds exist, what uh, areas of darkness exist in my life that I've become comfortable with, that I have accepted because no matter how much I pray or what I do, uh, they don't seem to go away. And I wonder if the issue isn't uh, that my doctrine is impure, that I don't read my Bible, that I don't love Jesus. I wonder what, what things are binding me down and what power I lack, though Scripture seems to promise so much power, um, not because it's not there and not because it's not available, but maybe I'm not on the go the way the scripture calls me to be on the go. I wonder how many of us here are at home in Babylon, strong doctrinally, read our Bible, go to church, legitimately, legitimately, I would say to you, as they were in Jerusalem, um, in love with Jesus, but incessantly held down by things that we don't understand. And I, I wonder if, perhaps, maybe perhaps, the, 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 the answer isn't therapy entirely. I wonder if the answer isn't sweating and praying 80 more hours a week that this will go away and flee you. I wonder if the answer may be seemingly unrelated and attached to obedience in the area of being more fluid and impermanent and open and surrendered to God. Uh, Matthew 28. This is awesome. This is our mission statement as a church. But I'm going to add the be- really I'm going to add the beginning and I'm going to add the end. I, may, I this is going to be a little long today. Hang in there. Cross your legs. If you got to go to the bathroom, you know I do too, and I can't leave, so don't leave. <laughs> Matthew 28. Jesus is about um, not to ask politely, not to suggest, um, but to command and demand that his disciples, and through them, uh, all disciples, anyone who would believe in him for the rest of history, he's about to demand the great mission is the great commission. It's also the great command to go to all nations. Now, it doesn't mean that we all go to all nations all the time, but it's basically saying to us on an individual basis, be open to, have the attitude such that you can be fluid enough that you go wherever I tell you to go and you stay as long as I tell you to stay and you pick up your cross every single day and you go and you go wherever I tell you to go. Now, people say to me, God has called me to this place for the rest of my life, and I would take them to Scripture and say, that is inconsistent with the Word of God. You may stay in this place the rest of your life, but God will tell you to stay in this place the rest of your life with an attitude that you will wake up every single day and pick up your cross and follow Him. You are not home yet. You may be right where you're supposed to be. You may need to own that land. You may need to raise cattle on that land. And you may do that till the day you die, but you better wake up every single day and it better be utterly surrendered to God because that is the word of God. And if you're telling me he's saying something different, then he is inconsistent and he is never inconsistent. Anyway, back to my point. He commanded us to go. He commanded us to be a community that goes. He commanded us to be individuals open to and going wherever he called us to go. But before he said that, listen to what he said. He said, all authority, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority on heaven, in heaven and on earth has been given to me. What is he saying? All power, all authority 
all ability, which is infinite, because remember, when you have authority in heaven, you speak things to, into existence on earth, and if you look down on earth and you don't see what you need, then you just create what you need. If you got three fish and you need 3,000 fish, you know what you do? You, 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 because you're God, not us, but him, he takes it, he blesses it, he prays for it, and he multiplies it. He can, he can, he's unlimited, he is infinite. He said all authority, all power, infinite power, infinite resources, infinite wisdom, infinite knowledge, infinite protection, infinite everything good, infinite every resource that you're ever going to need. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And implied in that very directly is, and I'm willing to give it to you. So he says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Infinite everything has been given to me. I got it all, guys. I got it all. And then he said, therefore, because of that, because of that great power I have, because of that great provision, therefore, because of that, I can now command you this. This is not an unfunded, unfunded mandate. I can bring great power with this mandate. Therefore, go to all nations, make disciples, baptize them, and teach them to obey everything I've commanded. And then at the end of it, he says, and I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Letting us know that that command wasn't simply for those who heard him, but it was for, the, for all of us who hear him through scripture to the end of the age, which we have not reached yet until we are with him forever in heaven. So he's saying, I got everything. And as you go, I'm going to dispense it into your life. And just so you can be sure, I'm never going to leave you or forsake you. You got it. You don't need to have it in your hand. You don't need to have it in your pocket. You don't need to have it in your mind. You don't even need to have it all in your heart yet. You believe this word. You receive it by faith. You go forward by faith, and these things will come out of you. Philip didn't know he could teach like this. Philip didn't know he could deliver people from demons. Philip didn't know that he had the power uh, and the stamina to preach and deliver people and see people healed. Philip didn't know that he had the courage to not run and hide and cower, but to be bold and radical for the Lord. He didn't know any of that. But God was keeping his promise. He, he allowed persecution. He allowed discomfort. He allowed crisis. He sent him sprawling. He turned to his God because of the gift that God gave him of the Spirit inside. And God began to keep the promise of the Great Commission as he went, as we go. The other day I was reading scripture, um, and this passage just leapt off to me. I'm out of, I'm out, this is more bonus information. Um, Psalm 84, this I think... This is this mindset that I'm about to present, that I've already been presenting, but that I'm going to close with. But that doesn't mean this is over soon. Um, I just want, I don't, I want, I don't want you, I want you to be, I want to be honest with you today. Um, this mindset is absolutely critical. It is absolutely essential. And, and I've read in books and places that our ability um, to more put our heart and our affection in the eternal um, to the expense of the temporal, um, comes in direct proportion to our maturity in Christ. In other words, when we're, when we're babes in Christ, it can be very much that, that doesn't matter how old we are, but when we're babes in Christ, when we're new to this relationship with Jesus, we need to have a sense that his benefits are immediate. We're like a child. Uh, if we get hungry, uh, we don't trust that there's a meal uh, that will come in time and we're willing to suffer for a little while. When we're a baby, that's why they scream in here so much. They want to be fed and they want to be fed right now, right? And when we get older, we're like, hey, I'm hungry, but that's only going to make me enjoy the meal better down the road. Uh, but in an eternal sense, hey, I can suffer for this life. I got eternal life, and we all need temporal blessings, and we all need uh, touches from God as we go along the way, but our ability to shift to this is, is in direct proportion to our maturity. Now, because we understand that to be true, we very often, early in someone's faith, talk about the immediate benefits. We lay back on the depth of the truth of the gospel, but I think we do that at peril to ourselves because we set people up for an expectation and for a lifestyle and for a philosophical understanding along with their faith that is absolutely incorrect. Um, for the most part, hear me clearly, for the most part, 
The prosperity gospel is a lie. It's a lie from the pit of hell, creating an expectation that obedience will lead to immediate wealth, status, and and a place in this world can't possibly be true. Does God prosper people? Yes. As we sow, do we reap? Absolutely. Does God give people great wealth on this earth? Absolutely, it must be true. Everything comes from him. Does God give authority and status in this world? Absolutely. But what I would say to you is our, our ability to receive from God like that is also in our direct proportion and willingness to hold loosely to that and to leverage it for what is eternal. So if you think God is going to give a crying little baby that demands its food right now, a bunch of food, a bunch of wealth, and enable that, think again. If you think God might perhaps, should it be his will, and he is not conscripted to this because everything we sow, we might just reap it in heaven. If we think that God uh, is going to give great wealth to someone who is completely surrendered to him for the purposes of his kingdom, well, now we might be on to something. But even that can't absolutely be made true. If you've been under teaching that says, I I am going to get a Rolex, and I'm going to be a CEO, and I'm going to have a new car, and I never have to be sick, and I never have to go through any affliction, you're going to be sorely disappointed. And you're going to exist around a community of people who are a bunch of liars who will make you feel terrible about your faith because clearly they have more faith than you because they get all the grace and you don't. But if you scratch on the surface of even them, they're suffering too. It's a lie. It's just not truth. God is wonderful. God is loving. He breaks in by the power of his Holy Spirit all the time. He heals. He loves. He does extraordinary things, except when he doesn't. And if all of our hope for Christ is is in this earth, in this era, in this age, in our current circumstances, then the Apostle Paul himself said we should be pitied over all people. There is no guarantee of wealth, but there is guarantee of glory, of comfort, of peace, and of joy beyond all understanding. There is absolutely a promise on earth before heaven that you can stand there flat-footed, courageous, strong, clear-minded, healthy, and wise to take on whatever circumstances you may be in. The Apostle Paul said, I have learned to be poor and I have learned to be rich. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every circumstance. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that's the gift. The Christ, the Spirit of God that dwells in our hearts. And you know, I hate to be that hard on the prosperity preachers, but they don't have it right. They just don't have it right. And they're feeding this garbage to an American church that's in Babylon that needs to come out. And it's time that we tell the truth about that. Uh, Me and a couple of you come back next week. We will continue on that journey. (laughs) Psalm 84. This just leapt off the page at me. There there are two interpretations to this passage. There is an interpretation that was contemporary to the time that it was written, and there is an interpretation for us right now. Remember, God's word is a living word. It's not just for history. It can be applied to us right now. So let me read it really quick. I'm going to read the first two verses, and I'm going to fast forward to the fifth verse so that we can be out of here in an hour or two. First verse, how lovely is your dwelling place, Lord. This is a psalmist who is getting ready to pilgrim Uh, to go on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, to the temple, to offer sacrifices, to worship, and to celebrate as is prescribed in the law, okay? But but, But the psalmist, in the way he is writing, we see is not simply going there out of fear, out of religious obligation, to check the religious box. The the psalmist, who is getting ready for this pilgrimage, as was described or, or defined or called by God's word, is fired up. They can't wait to go. They're really, really excited. And here's, here's their motive for going. Though it is prescribed by the law, though it is the right thing to do, their motive for going is this. How lovely is your dwelling place? How lovely is your temple? How lovely is the holy of holy? How lovely are the courts of our God? Uh, Lord Almighty, my soul yearns, it even faints, at the expectation and anticipation and hunger for the courts of my Lord. I want to go to the temple. I want to bring the best sacrifice I can offer. I want to see the glory and the smoke of God come out of the top. I want to go as close to the Holy of Holies as they'll let me go. I can't wait to go. I want to be close to God, and I I want to just relish in his presence. It says, my heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. They are hungry to go. 
Now they're getting ready to go on a pilgrimage. And, and as we know from history, many of these pilgrims that would go to Jerusalem at the appointed times in the year, um, it, was, it was a hard thing to do. It was quite a long journey. If you've been to Israel and you've been up to the northern part of Israel especially, or down in, in the desolate places in the wilderness, you know it's a really long way. And, and, and your tour guide will begin to describe to you um, what it meant for Jesus to go from like uh, um, from Caesarea or from um, somewhere up around uh, the, the Sea of Galilee all the way down to Jerusalem. It's a long way. And, and they didn't have hoverboards. And they have bikes. Why didn't they invent a bike? Surely they could have invented a bike. A mountain bike would have been awesome in biblical times. They didn't have motorcycles. They didn't have cars. They didn't have trains. They didn't have airplanes. They had none of the ease that we have in transportation. I complain every time I get on an airplane. I hate those things, but it was even worse than that. It took a long time. Now, when a family went on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, here's what they did. They brought the whole family. They brought all the food the family was going to need to eat for that journey that would take weeks and perhaps a month or two. They would bring uh, uh, the livestock and the things they had to take care of uh, while they were gone if there was no one to take care of it there. They had to bring the sacrifice, usually uh, some kind of livestock that was, was their best livestock because they were to bring the, bring the best fruit uh, first fruits, the best, the best of what they had to be offered to God. And so it was, it was a, a major thing. Now, we also know, you know, economically, most of these people weren't the wealthiest. They may have been okay. They may have been relatively middle class, but it took planning. It took precision. It took expectation. It was uncomfortable. It was dangerous. And, and, and it was at quite a great cost. Now, when the years went on people began to make the journey easier and they didn't bring as much stuff and they didn't bring all the people as a matter of fact when they wouldn't even bring their offering they would just bring some cash and they would purchase their offering at the temple they would bargain with someone outside the temple to get the best deal they could to check the religious box to offer the sacrifice to, to God and the Bible says that was the scene that Jesus walked into and he was he was mad he said, my father's house is to be a, a house of prayer for all nations, by the way, and, and, and it should be a place of worship, and it should be uh, a place of the best sacrifices and offering, and it should be a place of, uh, of leadership, and if somebody doesn't have enough, it should be a place of generosity, not where you exploit them. And he was mad. He said, my father's house is to be a house of prayer, a, pra a house of worship, a powerful place of his presence, and you've turned it into a den of robbers. Why would any foreigner be led to our light? Because there's no light here, right? So they had fallen away from this. But the ideal of Psalm 84 was when they were doing it right. In verse 5, the psalmist goes on to say, to make this, um, to make this observation. Uh, I like to read this like he is um, ascribing this great praise to God and this great longing to God. And in this part, perhaps God is responding and giving him this wonderful insight. And so it says, blessed Blessed are those whose strength is in you, um, who do this um, out of the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, who go at this great cost, willingly, uncomfortably, at this great cost, because they are so in love, so passionately in love with you, Lord. And though there is a lot uh, of material strength and physical strength that is required, they ultimately find the source of that strength in you and their passion for you. Uh, blessed are those whose strength is in you and from that whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. Whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. You can't talk them out of it. It's a lifestyle. We go to Jerusalem, we offer our sacrifices, we come all the way home, we work hard, we have a harvest, we have a life just to get ready to go and do it again because what we love is to be with the Lord and we live to go and to be near him. Uh, we are setting ourselves not just on a pilgrimage but a lifestyle of pilgrimage. Our heart is set on this pilgrimage on going to be with God. As they pass through the Valley of Baca, a place of desolation and a place of great danger where robbers would even come after them. As they go through this desolate and dangerous place they are so blessed by God his pleasure is so apparent that he meets them along the way the presence they can't wait to ex to to experience in the extreme in Jerusalem they begin to get down payments even as they go along the way they make it a place they make a desolate place a place of springs 
The autumn rains also cover it with pools. They are blessed by God. They are comforted by God. They are protected by God. They are anointed by God. And they are so blessed and protected and anointed, they are a witness to everyone around them. They are given life in a place of death. They're given light in a place of of darkness. They are springs in the wilderness. Uh, This is all a metaphor ultimately for the Spirit of God, which is life. And they go, even despite this constant pounding, they go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion and until each appears before God in Jerusalem at the temple, uh, beholding the glory that they long for. Now, I described to you as we went along what was happening in the historical reference, but let me quickly describe as we close what is happening, uh, the application of this for us. We know um, that Zion for us is not Jerusalem necessarily. It is not going to the temple in Israel necessarily. The Zion for us is described by God in Revelation as something that will descend from heaven to earth. The Bible says that when he returns, Christ returns, ultimately he will create a new heaven, a new heaven and a new earth. And, and, and the heavenly Jerusalem with the temple and all the wonderful things will descend from heaven to earth. And so the Zion that we pilgrim for is not a temporary place and a temporary location anymore. The Zion that we pilgrim for is the eternal Zion. It is for eternity. And we will not finish our pilgrimage until either we leave here or Christ comes here. Not till the end, not for, not for eternity. Therefore, our pilgrimage is also a lifestyle, and our pilgrimage is our whole life on earth before we go to heaven. We're on a pilgrimage. Now, blessed Blessed is Pastor Brian. Blessed are you. Blessed are we. When we don't just accept that, but we embrace it. Blessed are you when you set your heart on pilgrimage. Blessed are you when you set your heart on fire for the living God, when you are radicalized and all that matters to you, the really the only housing you're looking for on earth before heaven is to be housed in the saturation of the Spirit of God, to wake up daily and to hear his voice and to follow him. Blessed are you when your heart is set on pilgrimage. Blessed are you and blessed am I when our ears are set on the words of God and we're ready to stand up and do whatever he calls us to do. Blessed are you when we're set on pilgrimage. Uh, John Bunyan wrote a book, a great classical book. It's a classic. It is important. It's empirical. Next to the Bible, it's one of the most important things you could ever read. And the good news is that it's been translated into English in a form that you can almost understand what it says. And it's called Pilgrim's Progress. Anybody ever read Pilgrim's Progress? Anybody? Are you aware of the book? Like, cool. Some people are aware of it. Pilgrim's Progress was written by John Bunyan, and it is an allegory. And and in the allegory, there are these characters who come to faith in Jesus Christ, and they spend the rest of their lives, the rest of their existence, on a pilgrimage to the eternal city of Jerusalem, to heaven. And, and, And it talks about all the adventures and all the peril, all the danger, all the desolation And how God, just like he says here in Psalm 84, uh, makes them vessels of his transcendence uh, for them and through them makes them springs in the wilderness through the Spirit of God who produces pools through them and, and, and great abundance through them in a sense as they journey with God. And it's a wonderful book. And it's an important book. And it's probably something I should start suggesting you read the day you fall in love with Jesus Christ because what Bunyan does in that book, though it is an allegory, it should be taken more literally, what he does in that book is he sets our hearts in expectation of a lifestyle of pilgrimage. He is saying you are pilgrims and you should progress and you are never at home and you are never safe until you get all the way home and you are never safer and you're never closer to God on this earth unless you are following and moving with God. Every single time one of the characters in the book is tempted to settle down and to stop and to get comfortable and to live in Babylon, that is when they are under the most danger spiritually and eternally. That is the expectation. That is the lifestyle Jesus described. That is the truth of the scriptures. And that is the reason that many of us today live absolutely in bondage when Christ exists to set us free. Are you surrendered? Have you let go? Does this mean you need to literally move? No. 
but you might need to. The attitude is absolutely more important than the attitude, but the attitude will lead many of us to action. At a minimum, I think what it says to us is that we need to hold on to our possessions a whole lot more lightly. That we need to hold on to time more lightly. That we need to hold on to place, to space, to home, to even people more lightly. Enjoy it. Be there. Exist there as long as God has you there. But don't cling. Don't grip. Wake up every single day and be prepared for the Spirit of God to speak and continue to lead you on a pilgrimage, which you're on whether you recognize it or not. It gets a lot easier if you just accept the fact. We should hold on to it more loosely. And when God gives it to us, we should be absolutely desiring to use whatever we have in our hand, whatever he's having and given us to hold. Uh, for the purpose of leveraging it for, not for the temporal, but for the eternal. So that we can exist one day in the courts of Almighty God, so that we can live in heaven, the new Jerusalem, the place of unfettered access to God forever. And so, even now, on earth before heaven, we can enjoy the manifest presence of God. You want to experience God? Get on the move. All authority, all power, all presence, all anointing, all everything, infinite power exists for us. And God will stay with us forever. He will never leave us or forsake us. But right in the middle is a command that these two things are attached to. And it says to go. Absolutely go. Hold it loosely. Actually, don't hold it at all. Surrender it. Just leave it right there in your hand. And then leverage it and then enjoy the presence of God that comes from a lifestyle of fluidity and impermanence. That is the message over and over and over again in the book of Acts because that is how the church was established. That is how the church was expanded. And that is the reason that we are a church here uh, continents away today. That is the word of God. Not for the advanced Christians. Not for the PhDs in theology, not for the guy who's been in the church for 42 years, but for all of us, from the least to the greatest, as if those categories even exist in the kingdom of God, from the, from the babes in the faith to those who have been walking with Jesus for a long time. And to the degree and to the proportion we surrender to that, that we embrace it, God will bless us, he will anoint us, he will glorify us. He will give us peace, he will give us joy, he will give us wisdom, he will give us vision, he will give us so many things in, in, in replacement of all this darkness we've been existing in. And the answer, thank goodness, is not being a more religious person. It's just simply being more free. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we glorify you, we praise you, we lift you up. You have shared with us such wonderful wisdom, such incredible knowledge. Jesus, if you had not bled and, and died for us and washed us with your wonderful blood and filled us with your Holy Spirit, then we could ever be seeing and never perceiving. We could ever be hearing your word and never understanding. We couldn't believe it. We couldn't receive it. We couldn't be blessed by it. We could not embrace it. But you did, and we can. We know that our flesh is weak, but we also know that our spirit that is filled with your spirit is absolutely willing. I pray that you would give us the capacity today to turn down the volume of our bodies and turn up the volume of your spirit. I pray that you would give us this extraordinary desire and ability to follow you at all costs, to all places. Lord, set our heart on pilgrimage. Give us the wisdom, the precise knowledge we need to go with that, to know what that obedience means. And as we do, dear God, we pray that the blessings of your anointing, of your spirit, of your life, of your light, of your joy, of your peace, all the wonderful attributes of your spirit would just flood our being. You would bless us not just to be a blessing to ourselves, but to be a blessing to others. We surrender everything to you. We love you. And we actively anticipate you calling us to great things. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen.